welcome to this IUN Community Garden session, Implementing Rainwater Harvesting and Green Infrastructure in Community Gardens. My name is Leslie Kaiser. I'll be the moderator for today's session. The presenters for today are Kara Salazar and Sarah McMillan. Kara Salazar is Assistant Program Leader and Extension Specialist for Sustainable Communities affiliated with Illinois Indiana Sea Grant, Purdue University Extension, and the Purdue University Department of Forestry and Natural Resources. Working with multidisciplinary teams, Kara oversees the development and delivery of programs to support community planning and sustainable development strategies in communities across Indiana and Great Lakes states. Extension program focus areas include placemaking and enhancing public spaces, environmental planning, green infrastructure, and community development. Sarah McMillan is an associate professor in agricultural and biological engineering and convener of the water signature research area in the Center for the Environment at Purdue University. She is also a professional engineer with expertise in ecological restoration and urban stormwater management. Sarah's research focus on how humans impact water quality in rivers, lakes, and wetlands, and how climate change will affect access to clean water, sustainable food production, and healthy ecosystems. She uses lab and field-based techniques, along with modeling tools to develop solutions to environmental problems. Her current research focuses on restoring ecosystems to improve water quality, including projects on green infrastructure, sustainable urban agriculture, and watershed restoration. Kara and Sarah, we're glad to have you with us today. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm Kara Salazar and uh, Sarah and I will be tag teaming this presentation uh, today. So I'm going to go through uh, some of our introductory pieces of our project that we're excited to share with you. And then Sarah is going to talk more about the rainwater harvesting practices and how you can implement these in different types of scales and community gardens. Uh, so first I'll, I'll kick this off with a little bit of framing uh, before we get into more of our project details. Uh, we're working on a fairly large project um, between three different states. And so we've come together with um, colleagues from Minnesota and Pennsylvania and then our Indiana projects. Uh, and the reason behind this project is that we are focusing on issues uh, surrounding community resilience and climate change. We know that Great Lakes communities and several communities across the Midwest are experiencing more frequent storms, flooding events, and degraded water quality uh, from climate change as well as expanding urbanization. Those issues are um, coupling with each other. Uh, we also know that some communities are more vulnerable than others to these impacts due to location, socioeconomic status, and other factors. And many times the most, these most vulnerable communities have the fewest means to adapt to and mitigate uh, these water quality and quantity issues. So our project that we're looking at um, across these, these different states and communities uh, is highlighting how we can work together um, between community and government collaborators to improve community resilience and community quality of life. And our project in particular is focusing on rainwater harvesting systems and community gardens. And so, as I mentioned, our project team um, spans across three states and four different locations. You can see the listing of our collaborators here. Uh, this is a grant um, that's focused on water equity through the Sea Grant College Program. And as um, part of the Sea Grant College Program, um, this was an internal that we're able to apply for. And if you're not familiar with Sea Grant, I'll just give you a little bit of a, a background. Sea Grant is funded through the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Um, it's modeled um, a lot after the land grant system. Our Sea Grant programs though, however, are located within each state and many US territories with a coastline. Um, our Illinois Indiana Sea Grant program is co-managed between Purdue University and the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. We focus on several different types of topics of water resources related research, extension, technical assistance, and youth education and engagement. Uh, we are also part of the 
broader Great Lakes Sea Grant network. And we do a lot of collaborative projects together, hence the, uh, the way that we're collaborating with this team too. And so we have projects, as you can see, uh, within Duluth, uh, Minnesota. We had so much excitement about our project that we decided to have two, uh, one in Hammond and one in Michigan City. And we also have a project within Erie, Pennsylvania. Uh, the overarching objectives of this project is, of course, to, to work collaboratively and to learn from each other within these four communities. Uh, we're also providing um, some education and professional development opportunities, both through students as well as within the communities where we're working. And we're looking at this overarching assessment and engagement toolkit um, that we will create at the end of this project that can be applicable and shared in other communities. Uh, we're using uh, a three-stage process uh, for this, um, these efforts. Our projects are each a little different, but we're modeling um, this, this pathway in each, each area. We're starting with a background assessment and we're identifying some of the current hazards and vulnerabilities uh, the communities that we're working with have. Uh, we're then engaging also with community members and so we're doing listening sessions, different types of engagement and education activities uh, and ways that we can address um, opportunities for, um, for cli climate hazard and implementation projects. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then we're moving into implementation. And the focus of this is addressing multi-benefit green infrastructure as appropriate based on the scale and the size um, of the community effort. The other type of model that we're using for this is, um, which is overarching, and one of the things that was, is really exciting about it is that we're working at this neighborhood scale or one block scale. And it's, uh, we're drawing this from a rain, ready for rain one block framework. And the focus is on community green infrastructure projects. And the idea is that we're looking at uh, what's, uh, what the communities have, what they can build on, and uh, where are opportunities to have some visibility so that these projects could be uh, replicated in other areas. So we really want this to be a scalable and reproducible process. And it's really exciting too that we're working at a smaller scale so that we can work closely with partners and um, with residents in the area. One of the deliver deliverables, as I mentioned, is this um, community assessment and engagement toolkit. Uh, so we will create uh, a, a process and resources to help others learn from what we did, what we did within the communities, and how they can do it on their own. So how we did these background assessments, how we uh, worked with community engagement events, uh, what types of surveys and focus group questions we may have used, any kinds of lessons learned and replication um, opportunities. We'll also have some community summaries to highlight and showcase the great work uh, that the groups were able to accomplish. So these are uh, the two Northwest Indiana projects and project partners that we're focusing on. Um, as we, we mentioned in the focus of this talk today is that we are working on rainwater harvesting. Uh, this, uh, we selected these two sites based on uh, the longtime work of our Purdue Extension collaborators within the counties. And so within the, the Hammond project, we're working with the Intermission Community Farm. And this is a small uh, neighborhood community garden that has a series of raised beds. Uh, they have a corner lot and it's very accessible to the neighborhood. Uh, people come to volunteer um, to, to grow vegetables and to harvest and use them um, in their homes. Uh, the, the, one of the reasons why we selected this site too is that they do not have easy access to water. So they're hauling water from down the street or in cars. And so uh, this is one of the, the places and spaces uh, that we really wanted to target a community garden that had very little or unreliable access for watering. Uh, the other project that we're working on has a similar scenario in that they, um, this is the Michigan City project. We're working with the Smart Community Center, and this is part of the Community Action Partnership of, of community centers. Uh, this group has um, several different community-based programs, one of which is a, a senior-focused lunch, and they use um, the raised beds and vegetables uh, that they grow um, to provide to the, the residents that are in the neighborhood that are coming for these lunches. They also have um, several 
um, programs for youth and the youth are engaged in the growing and harvesting of vegetables too. Uh, so this, also, this site also needed uh, more access to water. Uh, so we have two very different types of community gardens, one um, both in residential settings, but one um, in, with more of a structure versus the other that is an open area. So our Northwest Indiana project team that has been assembled is a very multidisciplinary team. You can see the, the laundry list of our affiliations here. Uh, Sarah and I are coming uh, from, we're representing from the Illinois Indiana Sea Grant and Extension from my affiliation and Sarah with agriculture and biological engineering. Our colleague, um, Dr. Aaron Thompson is from Horticulture and Landscape Architecture. And Dr. Thompson is overseeing um, a student researcher, Christoph Davis, who is doing design uh, for the Intermission Community Farm and the standalone rainwater catchment structure that we're working on. Sarah is then um, overseeing Sebastian Stombach, who is an Ag and Biological Engineering student and is um, working on the design calculations for both of the sites. And it's been really exciting to work with the students and incorporate their ideas. And then also listed here here are Purdue Extension um, County staff who are have been instrumental in these projects, got them up and running and have provided a lot of technical assistance. And so we are continuing to work with them uh, throughout this process too. Uh, and so our process is also um, going through the same stages that I mentioned earlier. We um, have been working on background assessments of both of the sites to understand more um, of the history of the site, um, different types of uh, flooding or other types of issues they may or may not have. We also have been meeting with the community groups to understand their needs uh, for rainwater harvesting, uh, what some other opportunities may be for their community gardens for growth and, and access, and different types of preferences they may have for placing these um, these uh, rainwater harvesting systems. Uh, we then are moving into our implementation as soon as we're done with design and we'll be installing rain, um, rainwater harvesting systems and small rain gardens next to them to capture any overflow. We'll also have, um, we'll likely do these within volunteer work days. And then we'll also have opportunity for an education session to train people on how to use the rainwater harvesting systems as well as how to create their own in different ways. And so we are finishing up our designs right now. We've met um, quite a lot with our community partners and we're getting ready then to uh, plan for our uh, summer installation and our education sessions. Uh, what I'll transition into just a little bit is a, a bit of a preview of what, some of the things that we want to include into our toolkit and some of the things for uh, you all to consider too as you're working in community garden projects. As we're going through our site planning and analysis, um, some of the questions that we're talking um, about with our community partners are listed here. Um, and this is, these are things that we're doing both in collecting resources and information, um, you know, background documents, but also asking people questions directly um, about uh, the site planning and analysis step. So we want to know some of the, the key factors of the layout um, and any kind of pre-existing conditions or constraints. We also want to know the types of things people are interested in using and how they want to use them, where they could be stored, how they might be accessed, and different types of aesthetics that they want to maintain and how they want it to look. Um, Another th uh, key thing too to think about is how this system may impact surrounding areas or infrastructure. So do you have sight lines you need to worry about? Are there adjacent land uses that might be impacted? Uh, you also want to, of course, have the location marked and make sure you know where utilities are. Are there other uh, ask access issues um, as well? So you want to make sure to be able to use um, the, the rainwater harvesting system as it is intended. And one of the key things about uh, working in, in the planning and uh, design process is also working with local government. Sometimes this can be um, a, an overlooked aspect or perhaps an intimidating aspect, but it necessarily doesn't need to be. And it's also a very important step so that there aren't um, 
costs or unexpected outcomes that you weren't planning on uh, by not going through some of the, the ordinance and, and that discussion. So just a little bit of, of zoning and planning 101 uh, is what I want to cover in these next couple of slides. Uh, so many times um, zoning ordinances can, can look confusing or be confusing, of course, but uh, when it, you break it down, what it consists of uh, with zoning designations is you have a map, this nice colorful map, and you have a di different definitions of what these colors mean. Uh, so there, there are typically four broad categories for zoning, and they're broken up into agriculture, residential, commercial, and industrial. There are lots of subcategories and different uh, ways that they're divided too, but those are the four base ones to think about. And then you want to look at where your property or the site that you're working on with your garden lies within each of these four broad categories, because the different types of zoning ordinances will be written um, according to those types um, of, of locations. Uh, so they are also outlined in usually comprehensive plan or you can find your zoning ordinances to online fully uh, within your municipality. There's some other things too, some different words that you'll see or definitions um, for the permitted uses. So these are the things you can do within your different zones. So you have, okay, here's a use. This is what you can do and what's, what's allowed. Uh, you have accessory uses or structures. And these are things that you could build like a, a barn or a small structure. Um, there are special exceptions and variances. So special exceptions are things that they'll outline that here's, here's the baseline of what we're talking about, but you could also do a couple of other options. A variance is when you're going back and asking for to change something um, that's written in the code. And then temporary use is something like a temporary structure you may uh, put up. And so why this is important for community gardens um, to consider is that um, these do apply to, to garden sites. And in particular, things like structures are really important, even garden beds, uh, raised beds and where they're placed. Uh, so you might find if you don't have a garden ordinance or an agriculture ordinance in your community, you, this may fall under accessory uses or structures. So pay attention to how high something could be and how far back from a property line it needs to be. Many communities have signage ordinances, and so um, signs are really important to include for education purposes, but they also need to follow guidelines. And then many times you'll see um, these other things listed in ordinances too, uh, with sales of produce where you can do that, um, types of soil to use, and um, operational standards as far as compost, where it can be placed, um, fertilizer application and pesticide application, where you can park, um, and animal control ordinances too, uh, particularly with um, that as it pertains to, to chickens and livestock and things like that. So those are some things that um, folks may not always think about when you're getting ready to construct a neighborhood garden, even if it's small. But typically, if you're building or installing something on your property, you should check in and see if you need a permit. Also reference those setbacks and structure placements uh, because that provides guidance on where you can put, um, put something and how far away it needs to be. And so rain barrels and cistern structures um, fall within this um, the same aspect as well. And so that's why we're mentioning it. Uh, and when in doubt, or if you have questions or just wanna double check what you're, you're reading, contact your local planning office and tell them what you're doing and um, find, find out if there are other things that you hadn't thought of within your, their policies um, or ordinance guidelines. And again, this proactive planning and communication can really prevent some future unexpected changes and costs that you might have to do in the future. So we're going through those due diligence pieces too with our communities as we're placing and, and constructing these rainwater harvesting systems. And I'll close before I um, hand it over to Sarah. I've mentioned that we're doing um, community education programs and different types of efforts with our extension program. And one of the things that we will tie this work into is the rainscaping education program. And if you're interested in learning more about rain gardens and rainwater harvesting, this is a two day program that we offer in locations throughout the state. And so you can uh, learn more by going to our website there. And we will have some programs um, spring and, um, and fall coming up. And then we also have a grass to garden program, which um, trains people on how to start a community-based garden. And we have a lot of information on the website listed there for uh, learning more about it, as well as how you can sign up and get involved too. 
So now I'm going to transition over to Sarah uh, so that she can share the rainwater harvesting practices for community gardens. Thanks, Kara, and I'm excited to kind of pivot a little bit and talk about some of the technical details that we think of when we start to plan and design a um, system that can capture rainwater for use on site, particularly for watering um, vegetables and other kinds of produce, but you might be using this for watering, you know, areas that you're planting flowers or other things as well. So this is just kind of like a summary graphic to kind of put together in your minds all the things that kind of consider when we're thinking about these rainwater catchment systems. Um, but the goals ultimately are really to support community gardens and to figure out ways in which we can create multiple um, benefits for your garden and how we might design that, that water collection so that it's creating water supplies that are clean and safe for use. Um, oftentimes these are coupled with other green infrastructure practices to be able to prevent on-site flooding. This is common in many urban areas. Um, we have a lot of infrastructure and, and hardened landscapes around, so there can be periodic site flooding, so that can be combined in that way. And we really want to said make sure that the water we're collecting is as safe as possible to only not only protect um, the food that we're trying to grow, but also the folks who are using uh, that water during their their watering practices. So don't need to read all these little words on here. I'll go through a lot of these different components as as we go along. So um, go to the next slide, Kara. Thanks. So I'm going to go through a few photographs and kind of give you some different ways in which we can think about scale. So most of the rainwater harvesting that you think of with a rain barrel, we would put in a bucket of residential scale on-site harvesting of water. And these are pretty much, um, you see these a lot on homeowner scale kinds of projects. Typically a rain barrel store is about 55 gallons and it can supply water for several raised beds. So something like this um, three series of, of raised beds against this particular homeowner's backyard. And there's ways in which you can water from this. You can install gravity fed drip irrigation. Um, there's special types of timers and valve systems that allow that to um, water slowly and for periods of time that don't run your barrel out too quickly. Because much of the stuff you would go buy from like Lowe's or Home Depot or somewhere is really designed to kind of connect to your tap, which is a pressurized system. So there's some considerations there. Um, and the picture on the left is how we try to um, couple the green infrastructure and the water that we're capturing to use as irrigation water, because sometimes these buckets fill up, right? If we have big rainfalls and there's many of them coming in sequence, you can have those buckets fill and then they, they've got nowhere to go. And so you want that overflow water to not go into your basement or to not cause on-site flooding. And so what we're doing with our project is creating what we call overflow rain gardens. Um, these collect water that comes from off of the rooftops and channels it into rain garden plantings. And some of the things that are really a benefit to these rain gardens that are installed in this way is we can really target the types of plants that we use so that we can add in things like pollinators and other kinds of um, beneficial plants for, for um, growing other kinds of vegetables nearby. So next slide. Here's just some photographs. So the one on the left looks a little bit more, you know, cobbled together, you might think. We've got some trash cans, some tubing, but this this system and everything raised, one of them raised up on a bunch of cinder blocks. This thing functions really well. We've got multiple buckets flowing into each other and lots of great storage. We've got lids to prevent um, animals or other bugs and mosquitoes from coming into our water supply. And we've got a, on that upper raised bed, we've got a, a drip irrigation hose connection to allow that to water automatically. Things can look a little fancier and you can make these look really beautiful and aesthetically pleasing. Definitely have a little cost bump on that one, but you can imagine how these things might be different based on whatever situation you want. And there's a whole range of options. Go to the next slide. As we scale up two kinds of things that we're talking about in our discussion today, when we're thinking about community garden scale, oftentimes we're looking at larger volumes of water and wanting to collect more water for more gardens to be um, watered over the course of a growing season. These are, depending on the size of your community garden, um, the ones that we're working at are, are early on in their, I would say, in their development. So they have a relatively small scale number of beds, but like to would like to increase in 
in some cases. And so these community scale uh, cisterns can be quite a bit bigger and they can also be varied in shape. You'll notice though that in the middle picture is the most obvious, the dark green is kind of flattened against a building. Um, the one on the left is a, a, a metal kind of structure. And then the one on the right is actually hidden behind that um, wooden kind of decorative um, box, if you will. And in many cases, these larger volumes require a little bit more engineering to kind of make sure that they function well. They tend to have pumps associated with powering an irrigation system. Um, and we often are thinking about building or constructing some sort of rooftop area to collect water for to fill these these cisterns. Um, one other major consideration when we're thinking about water quality is we want to make sure that these are not clear or transparent because if sunlight comes and hits these we can get a lot of algal growth. You know we we definitely want to maintain as clean of water as we can and that's one kind of simple strategy for minimizing that. Okay, go to the next slide. And then we can get these that are really um, impressive in scale. And so you can see some people sitting on top of this particular uh, underground cistern that is being built. And those are those little cubes are modular. And essentially what they're doing is having a black plastic sheeting in a big, big hole and putting all these different blocks in. These are kind of like milk crates, if you can think what those looked like back in the day. Um, and they keep that structure uh, uh, sound so you have open space around all of that and that is your cistern underground and these tanks can be very very large and store large volumes of water they can irrigate you know entire soccer fields or you know playground areas and that kind of thing and there is often a treatment plant associated with these because there is water become coming into them directly from the overlying landscape so we've got rain falling on top of the soil that's that the tank being right underneath of it and filling in that way. You can also have pumping systems that bring water in in different ways. So these can become pretty complex, but they can also be really create offer really uh, innovative and creative ways to use that water. And so the picture on the right that you're the little um, kind of conceptual framing there shows that we're actually using them for toilet flushing and some other non potable uses. So that's kind of kind of interesting. Can you go on to the next slide, please? Okay, so pivot just a little bit and talk, how does this work? How do we start? What do we need to know? So Kara mentioned that one of the sites we're working with particularly has challenges with getting access to reliable and clean water on a, on a regular basis, particularly in the summer when there's really larger need for watering. And they're often even carting water from nearby homes or, or even in their own cars at times. So if this is a concern and an issue for your garden, where do you start? So the idea is here really understanding what, where do you need water? Do you need water just for your vegetable crops? Do you have areas where you're having other kinds of, um, you know, you might have overflow that you can use in watering grass or other kinds of things nearby? Um, how much water will you need? What kinds of crops are you gonna grow so you know when you need that water and how much of it? Is there other water supply available to you? Um, do you have water that you could potentially get access to a municipal potable supply? How much might that cost? Oftentimes we're finding that in community gardens specifically that are either on abandoned or vacant lots, setting up a new hydrant costs is pretty cost prohibitive um, because it has to be you know, weatherized and not allow for freezing and pipe bursts and things like that. So that can be really a challenge. So figuring out kind of where you get water, what is your water balance and how you can do that in your region is really important. Because what you need to store not only depends about how much rain you can collect, but really you wanna only store the rain that you might actually end up using because otherwise you're just gonna be storing water you don't ever need. So go on to the next slide. And so I kind of like this slide. This is taken from a really great handbook in um, that has developed in Oregon, but a lot of similarities across many of our kind of temperate landscapes. And so this is really common approach that we use. So the first step is really kind of thinking, so you know you want to collect the rainwater, so where do you start from there? Is we need to have a roof or some other type of impervious surface to capture that water and funnel it into our cistern. 
before it actually gets stored, we want to remove any debris. So that would be things like leaves, maybe animal droppings, um, all kinds of things, right? Sticks and other kinds of dust and things like that. But primarily we're talking about leaves and other kinds of vegetation. So we have, we'll show you some strategies in which we uh, think pretty low tech, but kind of creatively about how we can remove some of that. We put it in our storage bucket, oftentimes called a cistern, sometimes rain barrels, sometimes many rain barrels in series. We want these to be dark so they don't allow algae to grow, screened and things like that to prevent other um, access by insects or other kinds of critters. Um, how are we gonna deal with that overflow? I mentioned the rain garden, so we'll talk a little bit more about that. And then thinking about, um, do we need to treat this water on the back end? What is our intended use? And we're, that's one area that we are digging into a little more deeply with this project to make sure that we have some strong guidance around that and some uh, doing some additional sampling to make sure that we kind of have a good understanding of that treatment space. And then how are you gonna get it to your plants? Are you going to hand water? fill watering cans and hand water? Or do you want some uh, a gravity fed style drip system that you can just turn on and allow to run or can actually even be set up on a timer that's run by a solar powered battery and that can just go automatically. So there's lots of options. And so we'll talk through a bit, a bit about some of these pieces and then also um, available to help answer any questions. So let's go on to the next slide. So some of the things that I get questions about a lot is, is my roof suitable for collecting rainwater? Because we wanna make sure that the water we're running off of different kind of roof materials isn't going to be harmful. So this little table here basically says, generally most things are okay. We just typically do not want to use treated lumber as a roofing material because it has other kinds of chemicals in it for that treated to make it um, water resistant and those are chemicals that we don't want on our plants. Um, galvanized copper or metal roofs can actually leach metals so we don't want that typically and anything that would have a potential to be painted because of lead-based paints and the flaking off of that. So those are our big no-nos, but everything else is generally pretty okay. Um, we're finding that membrane um, roofs where you basically take kind of think of a commercial rooftop but these can be done relatively inexpensively with chipboard and wrapping that you can buy from most local hardware stores is a really cost effective way to get a clean and easy roof and you can get these made um, in white so you've got more um, sun reflective power and it's a bit more, uh, more cooling power too than underneath of that strange structure. So there's lots of options and um, all of them have different price points and availability and all that stuff. But the big consideration here is like, how much do you do that? Do you need to build a structure? And if so, like Kara mentioned, let's make sure that we do this in a way that we are in line with all of the per permits and ordinances that we need. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much covers that catchment area component. Um, I'm going to show you some examples here in a minute. Um, can you go to the next slide? Of what these things can look like. So this is a great example of a community garden in Richmond, Virginia. Um, on the left, you'll see their old shade structure. It's kind of a gazebo pergola style. It didn't even actually have a catchment surface for water on the roof. It was more of a small scale um, shade structure. And then they had some funding and decided to actually remove that structure. And you can also see they have a small cistern elevated on a, on a platform to assist with this gravity fed irrigation component. And they moved and they removed that, that shelter and actually built this new shelter that has multiple rain barrels connected to a fiberglass roof and is allowing more, more space for seating, um, connection with their community. And the picture on the bottom is what their garden structure looks like, which is really common for many community gardens. You have multiple raised beds and ability for um, egress and walking and, and kind of community, community engagement, I guess, between all of those different beds. So that's a really great example of a relatively small scale um, or low level uh, lift in terms of a design. It's not incredibly difficult uh, design wise to figure out how to build that. And it's a lot of materials that can be locally sourced. You don't have to hire um, a lot of extra professionals to build something on that scale. Um, next slide. But you can also get very, very creative. And so a lot of these are small scale, really simple versions that you can do today. If you have a bucket 
and a tarp, that top picture, you can just loop some, um, some twine around the grommets in your tarp, tie them up to some fence posts, put some rock in the middle to keep that cone shape for your catchment area. Actually, that rock is really beneficial because it acts as a filter for all those leaves and other debris we were, I was mentioning before. And you all of a sudden have a really nice catchment structure that is actually a benefit because it can be temporary. You can take it down when you, when you don't need it up. It can be used only during periods of, of time where you need it. You can also attach things to fence posts and fence rows and the pictures on the right, the little upside down umbrellas, those can be built to just attach directly to a freestanding rain barrel and they capture less water because the surface area of those umbrellas isn't that big, but they're able to capture water that can support those gardens in front of them. So there's a nice variety of options for you, some of which require a lot of engineering and a little more structural and uh, design and, and expertise. Others can be very um, almost homegrown and DIY that are pretty easy to achieve by comparison. Okay, can you go to the next slide, please? So let's talk a little bit about some of these different components. Now that we've got our catchment area, what are some of the things we need to consider? So I mentioned several times we need to be careful about leaves and other debris entering into our rain gardens. So the picture on the left is a leaf catcher. So that downspout from the top is coming off of your roof line and you're just having a pretty wide mesh screen on top of your next bit of collection system that's going into your rain barrel. And that gets a easy to clean spot for all those leaves that are quickly coming out off the, off the rooftops and can come into your system because you don't want those to be um, kind of filling up your system, creating spaces for bacteria to enter, etc. Um, the picture on the far right is probably something you are used to seeing. These are gutter guards, things that actually go on top of your gutters on your roof, a little bit more intensive and uh, maybe a little more difficult or require a little more effort to implement. Um, but these can be really effective for keeping your gutters clean and then provide the added benefit of keeping the water that you collect pretty clean as well. Uh, there is this is a, another point to make a, a point about the dark or opaque material to minimize algal growth. Looks like I, there's a few letters missing off of that last bullet point. Sorry about that. And essentially that just minimizes sunlight from entering into your, into your water storage bucket and that allows that algae to not, to not grow. Um, you can see on this particular one in the middle that water is flowing free fall into a cistern rather than being connected through a pipe of some sort. And that screen is then easily removable and clean, which is really, really great. Um, one thing to consider is if you have a rain barrel size cistern, it's pretty easy access to clean that with a bleach, a dilute bleach solution at the start of your growing season, kind of wash it out, get it ready to go before the season starts and you start built putting water in there for, for use later. Okay, next slide, please. This is a really cool um, and very mechanical solution. There is no um, energy inputs, no battery, no power uh, applied to this. It's just a little float and some little bit of creative rigging of some pipes. But essentially what we're doing with this little technique is we're allowing the first bit of roof runoff, the stuff that picks up all of that debris to be wasted and lost down that big pipe. So if you look at the, the picture of the, the actual you know, structure on your right, you can see two pipes coming down, one that continues on and one that just kind of stops. So that stop, that end stub is our first flush system. So what happens is water comes off the, off the rooftop, flows in and it fills that first, right? Cause that's, that's where the water is gonna go first. And so as the water fills, there's a, basically a ball that that floats it's like a ping pong ball or something similar and that floats up and as that that fills that ball will rise and once that that water or that length of pipe has been filled the ball will be at the top and the water will continue moving on to the tank that ball seals off that first flush chamber and then after the rain event, you unscrew the bottom of that first flush chamber, let all of that water come out, all of the leaves and other debris that you may have collected, clean it out and you're ready for your next rain event. You can go on to the next one. Um, I think this one is just a little bit more of the similar kinds of things, kind of illustrating all of the components that you can include if you're wanting to be able to create something and all the things to kind of put them all together in one component. Um, I like the picture on the right because it's showing it in a larger cistern type situation. There might be larger farm, 
farms or community gardens or market farms that have need for a lot of water. And you can imagine that there might be some more uh, considerations that are needed here. So we might have a floating intake, intake instead of one that's just off the bottom. We might have water coming in in different ways. In this case, you're showing water coming in from the bottom and a U-bend, the bottom little U, so that you don't have water sh um, shooting into the bottom and any debris that's settled at the bottom is kind of stabilized and it's not recirculating all of that. Um, so there's lots of, of little things to consider, but I think the key things is figuring out it's better to try to remove those bits of debris before they get in rather than try to clean the cistern after you've had it full of all these different kinds of environmental inputs. Okay, so we can go to the next one. Um, some structural, I, I think this one is just a nice example of these things put together. The same photograph there on the left that we saw earlier, but it's showing some of the connections in a minute that I'll talk about with the irrigation project or approach. And on the right is a simpler structure um, where you can actually maximize your rooftop area by having the two roofs connect kind of kind of non-intuitively in the middle, so you only have one gutter running down the center into one cistern. So this is a really clever way to have wider, uh, more seed, more potential for shade underneath, and more rooftop area collection. Okay, the next slide, please. So I'd like to pivot now to talk a little bit, okay, now you've got your water, what do you do with it and how do you use it? So considerations and approaches for doing so. Like I said at the beginning, this is really dependent upon your community, who your volunteers are, what your needs are, how big of a garden you have, but the, the gravity fed irrigation is a really, um, can be a really powerful way for folks to be able to uh, minimize the time that they need to spend watering and maximize the time they can do other activities like weeding or harvesting. Um, sometimes the gravity fed system to be depending on your layout of your site, um, the number of beds you have may be insufficient to get water to all of your gardens and you might need to use a powered system. Um, there's options for doing that that are relatively um, not super involved in that you can use things like small marine style bilge pumps, almost like a sump pump um, or smaller pumps that you have a, a tube that goes down into your cistern. They can be powered off of a 12 volt battery connected to a solar panel. It's a little more involved in terms of setting up that irrigation system, but they work really well and they're not um, that obtrusive and they're relatively low profile. So they're, they kind of make sense for community gardeners. Um, I really like these gravity fed irrigation timers, though, because they're really small footprint. They can be used um, um, and by solar power and they just kind of turn on and run for like 30 minutes a day, let's say, and they just kind of allow that water to slowly drain and that keeps your your beds nice and moist. Um, some safety considerations and safe produce is important. We want to make sure that we never use collected rainwater for produce washing. So I know many structures are thinking, okay, we have this wonderful structure. Let's also add a produce washing or a, a, a area where we can clean up our produce for, for market or for distribution to our, our members. This is this water should not be used for that because it's not been treated as such because there's potential for E. coli contamination and other kinds of things. But if you're using it for irrigation, putting it directly into the soil, not coming into contact with the food itself right after right before you're going to eat it, let's say that is a really that is a relatively safe and useful way to do that. So if you can um, lay down drip tape or drip lines like that's shown in that picture on the left and kind of illustrated on the picture on the right in a little cartoon version. This allows water to go directly into the soil rather than spraying down on top of the plants themselves. And that's a better way to minimize contact with the food. Um, when you're having raised beds, it is a little bit, um, there's some design considerations we can talk through about how you might get the water from the tank across, a, across the, the site up the side of the raised bed and into your planted area. So there's, you know, some great sources for these different kinds of connectors where you can have flexible or rigid piping and the different kinds of connectors that can go there. Okay, I want to say thank you for on behalf of Kara and myself. Um, we are really excited to be here today and, and hopefully we can answer some questions. Um, a lot of these things are very site specific. And so the site planning and the layout and those considerations I think are the most important first step. So with that, I will end and see if we have time for a couple questions. Thanks.
So I'll get started with a quick question that I have. Um, do you guys work strictly in the state? How does it work, say, if a community garden is getting started, they want to consider an irrigation system? Um, how does that process work? What are the steps involved? What we like to do too is um, refer people to their local county extension office. So they have a wealth of resources and information there to draw on. And so that's a really great first line of education and, and stopping in for either virtually or, or in person too sometimes uh, for, for what they have to offer and what their levels of expertise. Um, then depending on the complications of the project or where things are, um, they have access and we have access to a variety of different um, people and resources. Of course, we can certainly answer questions um, based on needs. We're also developing this toolkit and some additional resources to help communities with um, setting up these types of systems. That's one of the main deliverables of, of this project. In addition to doing it, having these um, design specifications outlined, having instructions that go with it and having some education sessions so that people can really do it themselves too. Okay, great, thank you. For folks who end up watching this later, if you do have questions, you can reach out to us. But to underscore uh, Kara's comment, your local county folks are, are your first kind of resource. They often know those ordinances really well. They often know kind of community garden locations or where to buy certain kinds of materials and really great resources. But we are here to help answer questions as well. So thanks for the invitation. Thank you for having us.